Okay, so as you guys know, we're going through the, the book Always Ready by Greg Bonson. Now, how many people in here understand every single big word that Greg Bonson says? Probably none of us, right? So what I'm going to try to do is take those big words, condense them down into words that maybe we can understand and actually put into practice. So for the next two weeks, we're going to go through a practical application of presuppositional apologetics for beginners. Okay, so with that, I want to go move a little quickly at first. So where do we begin? I want to give you the basic concept of what presuppositional, apolog presuppositional apologetics is and how to employ it. So the basic concept is that everyone has presuppositions. Presuppositions are basic assumptions about reality. It's kind of like where you start. These are the things that you come into the argument assuming. Everybody comes to the argument assuming there is truth. Assuming that we can communicate, that we understand language, the uniformity of nature, that tomorrow is going to be like today when we talk about science. If tomorrow wasn't like today, well, why would we believe any scientific experiment could prove something going into the future? So everyone has presuppositions. And like Greg Bonson says, no one is neutral. The, the presupposition from the unbeliever is antagonistic in opposition to God's word. Our presupposition is no, God has spoken and we're going to come from that angle. So we're going to be at odds with one another. Your worldview world will be determined by your ultimate starting point. So where you start is vital in presuppositionalism. Okay, and we're going to go through that a little bit more. This is also known as a transcendental argument, which means <clears throat> a transcendental argument is what must be true for anything else to be true. So in other words, for truth to even be proclaimed, we need laws of logic, okay, uniformity of nature. We need these things in place before we move forward. A simple transcendental argument would be this. Someone comes up to you and says, there is no truth. What do you say? Is that true? <laughs> If, they, if they're making a, a truth statement that denies truth, it's self-defeating, okay? It's going to commit suicide. So the, the presuppositional argument is an argument that's uh, not self-defeating, whereas the atheistic arguments are. We're going to go through that. Where you start is the most important point because it determines where you end. Real simple il illustration. If you were playing baseball and you get your bat and you walk out to second base and you're facing center field, where you start is wrong. The pitcher is going to throw the ball over home plate and you're not going to be there. So <clears throat> the goal in baseball is to start at home plate, circle the bases, and get back to home plate. You starting on second base is in the wrong spot. Okay, So where you start with your worldview is going to make all the difference. Starting in the wrong place leads to contradictions, inconsistency, and arbitrariness. We critique worldviews internally for contradictions, inconsistency, and arbitrariness. Contradictory, inconsistent, and incoherent worldviews must be rejected. So if you can find an internal contradiction in someone else's worldview, well, then that means it's self-defeating. It's contradicting itself. If it's not consistent in the way it applies truth to certain things, we can reject it. So with worldview, uh, with, with presuppositionalism, you're going to do an internal critique, which means you're going to jump into that person's worldview and assume the tenets of that worldview and examine it from within. I call this the hokey pokey principle. Right? You guys ever played a hokey pokey? Sing the hokey pokey, you put one arm in, you pull one arm out, right? So what we don't want to do is stand in our worldview, stick our hand in theirs, play with it, and come back. And say, see, it's wrong. Because that's what atheists do to us. They stand over here, right? they stick one arm in and say, oh, God's evil, he kills people, look at this. And they, they, from their worldview, they're trying to make an assessment of ours. The hokey pokey principle means you've got to put the whole body in. You sit in their worldview, think everything that they would, take their, the tenets of their worldview and apply it to itself and see if it's internally consistent or contradictory. 
<clears throat> it demonstrates, presuppositional, presuppositionalism demonstrates that their starting point, their presuppositions, are inadequate to provide the necessary preconditions of intelligibility. Logic, uniformity of nature, uh, moral laws, physical laws. All right, your worldview must provide these things in order to understand truth. Does that make sense so far? So if your worldview doesn't give you the ability to bring forth the preconditions of intelligibility, it has to be rejected. It's unintelligible. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of basic definitions so that we know where we're starting. I'm going to try to boil these down and make it a little simpler for us. So the first one you've heard Pastor talk about autonomy. Autonomy basically means self-law or independent thinking. So I call it going Eve, like going rogue. When Eve was in the garden, Adam told her what God said. You, touch the, you, you, you eat the, the, the fruit of the tree, you're going to die. She now gets approached by the serpent. So instead of standing on God's word and what he said, she moved off of it and now started to listen to someone else's word and now is deliberating, okay, which one is right? The moment you get off of God's word, you, you are going to have a problem. Now you made yourself the arbiter of truth versus God. So Satan comes along crafty, throws, throws in a couple of a lies, a couple of questions, to, to make you doubt God's truthfulness, and now you're going to make the decision. So autonomy basically means you're going to stand on God's word. You're not going to come to truth on your own apart from, apart from what God says. Make sense? Okay. A brute fact. An uninterpreted fact that stands alone without reference to some other fact, especially to God. Presuppositional apologetics denies brute factuality in that all facts are created and controlled by God according to his plan and for his glory. So a brute fact is a fact that has no explanation behind it. It just is. Okay. Now, our buddy Eli, he says, God is the father of all facts. I love that. Every fact that's a fact is a fact because God made it a fact. He's the one who defines everything. Now, I'm going to do a little illustration, and I know some of you have seen this. If you have, just bear with me. If you haven't, pay attention. So can anybody in the room tell me what this is? Someone. Butter knife. Okay, so now I'm not from around here. I've never seen a butter knife, heard of what a butter knife is. How could you prove to me that this was a butter knife? This is the easy question. Somebody's going to make toast and you spread the butter. And I'll be like, oh, that's really nice. However, I've been to some of your houses. And I've seen some of the guys in their little tool drawer, they take this thing out and they use it like a screwdriver, right? And I've seen some of the women struggling to open up cans. So they put it on the edge and they pull in and use it as a pry bar. And then sometimes if you're in a jam and you got to hang up a picture, you take the back of this, right, and you, you tap something into the wall and you can hang your picture. <clears throat> there are even some kids who drew circles on the wall and they start fling, trying to get it into the center of the circle. I also know that if an intruder came into the house, you would grab this like this and you could use it as a really good weapon. So although you say it's a butter knife, I'm telling you, that this is a multi-purpose tool. You're limiting what it actually was made for. So now I have empirical, scientifically verifiable evidence that this is a screwdriver, a pry bar, a little hammer, a weapon, and a, a, a thing you could play games with. How could you prove me wrong? What's the only way you can prove me wrong? By introducing me to the creator of the butter knife who said, I made this to spread butter. Yes, you can use it for other things, but that's a misuse of what I made it for because I defined it. Now think about how that can apply to humanity and human beings. Some people say, hey, we could use humans as slaves. <laughs> you know, from a, from a practical standpoint, it's really cheap, it's very productive, and we pump out a lot of product. Well, better yet, 
you know, we got these, this new medicine out and we really don't know how it's gonna work. Maybe we'll just pull some human beings aside and use them as guinea pigs. Let them, so they could be test cases for our experimental medicine. Now, wouldn't that be using human beings for the good of humanity? Oh, from, from a practical standpoint or a pragmatic standpoint, absolutely. But from a, a worldview with God, you're misusing human beings. You cannot do that. And there's many, many other ways that people misuse human beings, right? So only when you come into contact with the creator can you be certain of what something is and can you use it correctly or incorrectly, right? So that's very important with the brute fact. Watch this. <clears throat> Bertrand Russell, the universe just is and that's all. That's a brute fact. Now, if I put the word God in there, God just is and that's all, would he accept that? No, <laughs> that's not a brute fact. So who makes the brute fact? He does. He arbitrarily designed it, de defined it, right? So the person is acting arbitrarily. He says, well, it just is without any grounding. And it has this, this particular fact has no connection to anything else. Isn't that convenient, right? This is autonomy. He steps off God's revelation, and now he's the arbiter of, of what a fact is and isn't. He gets to define it. We reject that. Internal, it's internally inconsistent. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> epistemology is a big word, and it's based on two Greek words, epistemi, which means knowledge, knowledge and logos, which, which means word. So epistemology is the study of the nature of human knowledge. It addresses questions about truth, belief, justification, etc., how it addresses how you can know what you know. How do you know what you know? Is it information? Is it revelation? How do you, how do you determine what this is if you don't have anybody telling you what this is? It's very important. Your epistemology is part of your worldview and you need to know how you access truth and certainty or truth and falsity. How do you know something is true or false. That's what epistemology is going to address. Okay, and we're going to get a little bit, this is, I'm trying to water it down and then we're going to go to a really basic illustration. Hopefully it'll, it'll put the pieces together. Next is your metaphysic. This is, meta means beyond, physica is physics or nature. Metaphysic literally means beyond the physical. That is beyond the physical world sense of perception. It's the study or the, of the structure or the framework of nature and reality, the nature of reality. It provides the necessary context. So if I told you, hey, last night, did you see the Yankees? They scored two touchdowns. You'd be like, wait a second. I know the Yankees, and that's not baseball. That's a different field, right? <clears throat> so metaphysics is basically the field that you're playing on. Right? What is the field that we're playing on in this world and where does it come from? Who defines it? How do you know what, the meta, what, what your metaphysic is? So when you find somebody who's playing football on a baseball field, you can say that's inconsistent. That's a contradiction. So as we compare worldviews, that's what we're going to look for. So the metaphysic is basically your structure of reality or what game you're playing. Next is transcendental reasoning, and we went over this real quickly. What conditions must be satisfied for any particular instance of knowledge to be possible? In other words, what must be true for anything else to be true, right? If I said, listen, walk up these stairs and go on to the second floor, what must be true? You need a first floor, right? You can't have a second floor without a first floor, and you can't have a first floor without a foundation, Right? So the transcendental argument starts at the foundation. What are we standing on in order to build our house? What are we standing on in order for anything else to be true? Is this making sense? We're doing good? Okay, good. Truth. Truth, there's a, a theory called the correspondence theory. And they'll say that truth is that which comes, corresponds to reality. And that's true in and of itself. The problem is who defines reality? Hitler? Mother Teresa? Who, who defines reality? 
That's the problem. So we have to find out what reality is. Now, for the Christian, it's real simple. Truth is that which corresponds to the mind of God. In other words, truth is that which corresponds to God's word or his scriptures. Oh, no sound. Oh, I had a nice little bell when the... Oh, all right, whatever. All right, so truth is that which corresponds to the mind of God. <clears throat> so God, who's omniscient, he knows everything. If an omniscient God reveals something to you about the world, <clears throat> you can know it, but not just know it, you can know it with certainty because he knows everything. If you're floating around and you walk into one of these and you see somebody in their house doing this, you can say, oh, wow, this is a pry bar. I saw it with my own eyes. I actually tried it with my own hands and it works. How are you going to uh, uh, convince the person that it's not just a pry bar. They're going to need to know who made it. That's the person who defined it. You've got to introduce them to the creator. And it's the same thing with the world that we live in. So truth for the Christian is that which corresponds to the mind of God. Preconditions of intelligibility. All right, here's another long phrase. It's the conditions that must be accepted as true before we can know anything about the universe. The preconditions, the condition beforehand, precondition of intelligibility, are things that most people take for granted. A logically correct worldview must provide these preconditions of intelligibility because without them, we could not know anything about the universe. In other words, <clears throat> the laws of logic, uniformity of nature, moral laws, mathematical laws, personhood. What's a person? If that's not defined up front, and most people don't define that up front, and now come to the table and say, well, we know what a person is, but you see what's happening in today's society. Person may not be a person. Gender may not be gender. Love means something different. Science could mean something completely different. So now the preconditions of intelligibility from our standpoint never change. On theirs, it fluctuates because it's not grounded in one being on their worldview or an atheistic worldview, it's grounded in the subjective mind of each of these people, right? So each one become the arbiter of their own truth. Whereas we stand on the word of God, we understand that there's one truth. God has defined everything for us already. Okay, last one is worldview. And this is probably the most important one. So a worldview is a, net, a, a, a network or system of our most basic beliefs about reality in light of which all observations are interpreted. Worldview is like the lens you look through when you look out at the world. Real easy. So you ever hear somebody say, oh, he's got rose colored glasses on. Everything he sees through these, these guys, oh, everything's, everything's rosy. <laughs> he's looking through rose colored glasses. For us, we look through the lens of scripture. We see everything through the lens of Jesus Christ because he's the, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of reality. Basically, it's going to... Uh, oh, I'm missing something. Okay. Um, your worldview is composed of your metaphysic, the structure of, the, of the, the plain ground you're working on, your epistemology, how you know what you know, and your ethic, your moral law. Worldview is going to look basically something like this. Your world, that's the globe, and it's composed of a bunch of different pieces. And all these pieces need to, need to fit together uh, logically and coherently. If a piece is out of the puzzle, well, something's wrong. They may call this a brute fact. Oh, that's just hanging out there. You know, nobody's defined it. it it's, it's not attached to anything else. So when we go to put our worldview together, it's going to look like a puzzle. And we're going to put all the pieces together. Metaphysic is the framework of reality that provides context. So every fact in this world is related to another fact, right? So it doesn't matter what, I, what, I, what fact I would tell you, it's dependent on something else. And whatever that is dependent on, that's a fact, and it's dependent on something else. All of our facts are interdependent and ultimately depend on God for their, for their truth, okay? Are we, we're good so far? All right, good. Epistemology, how you know what you know. 
uh, and your ethic the proper use of facts. We don't want to misuse one of the puzzle pieces and try to force it into the puzzle. All right, that would be wrong. We need it to fit nicely. Now, your worldview is untestable by natural science. It's tested and affirmed by consistency and coherence. So when we do an internal critique of the Christian worldview and an internal critique of the Muslim worldview and an internal critique of the atheistic worldview, <clears throat> there's no way, you, there's no scientific experiment that you can do that can prove what the metaphysic is except for the fact that it's self-attesting and it's coherent and consistent, not contradictory. Did you ever <clears throat> think about this? That there's no scientific experiment that you can do that can prove that the scientific method is the only way to know something? The scientific method can't tell you uh, that what the Nazis did in Germany was wrong. The, the scientific method can't tell you that um, the world didn't start a week ago and we were all uh, we were all created with memories that go back further than that. The scientific method can't tell you that there's other minds in this room besides your own. Scientific method can't tell you a lot of things because the scientific method is a tool to measure nature, natural things. So if I was walking on a, a beach and I had a metal detector and I go up and down the beach all day long and then I come back at the end of the day and say, you know, there's no water plastic on the beach. You're like, dude, you were using a metal detector. <laughs> no, no metal. Or You're using the wrong tool. <laughs> you cannot measure a worldview with, with the scientific method. Scientific method is designed to measure things that appear in nature. Okay, it's like trying to weigh a chicken with a yardstick. You'll get that tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> Presuppositionalism examines an entire system against another entire system. So this is worldview against worldview in its entirety. What an evidentialist does, he takes little bits and pieces of the puzzle here, little bits and pieces of the puzzle here, and then compares them. And that's not the right thing to do because it's not that we can't use evidence. We certainly do. But the atheist is coming not from a position of neutrality. He's hostile. He does not believe in God. He's rejecting that. And once you do, <clears throat> if you come off of that and say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stand on the scriptures. You're going Eve. You're going rogue. All right, now I'm going to explain it from my point of view, not God's. And then you're just going to get into a, an argument and not get anywhere. And again, um, it's not that you can't use evidence. Of course, evidence is going to flow from your worldview. I love presuppositionalism because I get to stand at the foundation and then use the evidence that supports my position. Right. And I tell the person, listen, you know, God exists. Like the Bible says that, you know, God exists. You're in contact with God right now. You're using the preconditions of intelligibility that your worldview can't can't give us. You're you're stealing from God in order to deny the, the things that the God who gave you these things. Right. OK, so it's entire system against entire system, not little bits and pieces. Every worldview requires an objective, fundamental starting or reference point. That's vital. If the atheist or whoever it is you're talking to can't tell you what their starting point is, <clears throat> you reject it. Say, I'm not, well, they, a lot of times, so we're going to get into an example soon. A guy keeps asking me for evidence. Well, you, I need evidence for a God. I need evidence. And I say, listen, evidence presupposes truth. How do you ground truth on your worldview? This is not about me. This is about you. Prove your God. I said, no, you don't understand. Your worldview can't even give you truth or access to what's true or false. So you're just going to continue to deny this and not give an accounting for your worldview. If you're telling me that I need evidence and you would never adopt a worldview without evidence, then just simply give me the evidence for your worldview. <laughs> they won't do that because they have none. All right, and the butter knife, okay, the butter knife illustration. So facts need a context and a reference point. For this illustration, the reference point would be the, the inventor of the butter knife. You go right back to him. He says, no, look, this is what it's for. Oh, yeah, you can use it to hurt somebody and defend yourself and as a toy and all these different things, but that's not what it was intended for. So in order to know a fact is a fact, you've got to go back to the source of that fact. 
Presuppositionalism is sometimes called worldview apologetics. Again, we're looking at entire systems and seeing how they, <clears throat> how they compare with each other. And the last one, oh, okay, I'm sorry, metaphysic. What did I say metaphysic was? This is going to be a little illustration and, and short quiz. What is, what was, what's the metaphysic? Yes. Again? Aaron? Outside of the physical, right? And for, for, for our illustration, it's the structure of reality, our context, our framework, right? So basically, my illustration is going to be like this. We're going to put together a puzzle, right? The puzzle, anybody who puts together puzzles generally tries to do the outside first, right? Because you got all the flat edges and you start lining them up. And once you get the whole framework of the puzzle done, now you can start filling it in. But at least you have a good head start. So when you're looking at a worldview, think the metaphysic is the structure of the puzzle. We're going to put together a puzzle. Now in this puzzle, every piece needs to put in, be put in its place correctly. If you start forcing things into the puzzle, well, maybe that piece doesn't belong in the puzzle, or maybe that piece is going to expose a contradiction in your worldview, which would nullify it, okay, which would prove that it's wrong. So now, what else do we need when we're putting together a puzzle? We usually open the box, right, and, you know, you put the puzzle pieces on a table, but you got the box top, Right? The box top shows you ultimately what the puzzle should look like when it's finished. What would happen if you didn't have a box top? <laughs> like with a couple of thousand piece puzzle. It'd be very, very difficult to put that puzzle together because you don't even know what it looks like. Right? So without a box top <laughs> and a structure, a metaphysic, what are you putting together? You could be in the middle of that puzzle and think it's, it's a horse when it's really a mountain. You have no certainty without that box top, right? You don't know what direction the puzzle's going because you weren't shown that up front. But if you have the box top up front, and as Christians we do, we have the scriptures that give us the whole structure of reality. Now when we look at the, the pieces of the puzzle, we can now see how they start to fit together to form a view of reality. So the metaphysic is our context, our framework. Then we have facts. And what are facts in, in our little illustration here? How do we, uh, if I say it, you're going to, how do we know what a fact is? What would that be? Part? Huh? Right, God told us. But <clears throat> what's that called? What's the big word? Epistemology, right? How you know what you know. How do you know that a fact is a fact, right? <clears throat> that's, that's epistemology. So the facts are the individual puzzle pieces. And each piece is necessary. It connects to something else. And it comprises, it's part of the whole picture. Right? All the puzzle pieces need to fit together. And they need to match the box top. If they don't match the box top, they don't belong in this puzzle. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me at my house. We got a bunch of boxes of puzzles and pieces in all different boxes, and we have no idea which is which. That's what most people do with their worldview. They have pieces, especially Christians. They got a piece from here and a piece from that book and the book of Revelation. I got a piece. Of it, and they have worldviews, a jumble mess. It's only when you start to put those things together, okay, and make a nice, neat puzzle that you understand what the whole thing is. Okay. Next we have coherency and consistency. So what would this kind of relate to in the definitions that we, we went through so far? All right. This is where it would be ethical, right? <clears throat> so it would be wrong to misuse a human being as a slave or uh, for medical experimentation because a human being is created in the image of God. It would be Wrong to use a butter knife to put a screw in or use it as a hammer or as a weapon. Okay? It would be practically useful, okay? but ultimately it's, it's a misunderstanding of what it was meant for. Okay? So it's a violation of purpose. 
You're violating the purpose of this butter knife. So when we put, put the pieces in the puzzle here, if they don't fit, you know, if you ever try to jam a piece, like you, it, this has got to fit, I know it fits here, and you're pushing it in, and you make it fit. <laughs> but it's wrong, and you know it's wrong, because it doesn't look like everything else. That's a misapplication of the fact. So you need every worldview is comprised of metaphysic, epistemology, and your ethic. So this would violate the ethic or be the ethical part of this illustration. And it would also provide context. Once you start putting all these puzzle pieces together, you'd be like, oh, I understand that we're on a baseball field, and I understand that these are bases, and that's a pitcher's mound. And you start understanding the game. Right? When you put the, together the puzzle pieces of your worldview, you start understanding reality and what it's, what it's about, especially when you read the scriptures, because the scriptures are the story of reality. Next is contradiction and arbitrariness. And this is what we know as brute facts. Where is it? There we go. Now, do those look like they fit? Does it matter? Yeah, of course it matters. It matters if you're trying to put together a coherent worldview without contradictions and without being arbitrary. The atheist says, well, it's, it is what it is, and that's all that it is. I don't, it doesn't need to be grounded. Really? So would you accept that if I said, well, God doesn't need grounding? No, 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 we need evidence. Well, I need evidence that that fact is a brute fact. And if that brute fact has no bearing on any other fact, then it's irrelevant. But you're not using that brute fact in an irrelevant way. It's very relevant to you making your point. But you're saying, <clears throat> you're contradicting yourself and saying it's a brute fact, it's not connected to anything else. So when somebody says, oh, we have a brute fact here, you say, no, I don't grant you that. You need to ground that fact. Tell me how you know that it's a brute fact and tell me how it's not related to anything else. The very fact that you're calling it a brute fact and using it in your argument tells me that it's not a brute fact. <laughs> you need it to substantiate all the other tenets of your worldview. And finally, the preconditions of intelligibility. Right? These are the things that must be true in order for anything else to be true. So <clears throat> if there's going to be truth at all, the question is how do we ground it, right? And finally, the last one, truth. Does it match the box top? If the box top looks like this and you end up with your puzzle not looking anything like this, well then you know you messed up. You're missing pieces or you just didn't get it right. <clears throat> the problem is, if there is no box top, you can make any puzzle you want, but it can't be proven true or false. Without a box top, all right, a picture that you're going by, you cannot know if something is right or wrong. Again, go back to the butter knife. If, if, you're not, if you weren't introduced to the creator of the butter knife, how could somebody convince you that this wasn't a screwdriver or a multi-purpose tool. They couldn't do it with just physical evidence. You need the metaphysical structure around it, which <clears throat> would mean the creator came, uh, the inventor of the butter knife came, he designed it, he made it for a specific purpose. Without that, you're flying in the wind. How else are you going to figure out what this is apart from the creator? You can't use physical means to do that, okay? So your worldview, has to line up with how you live. So if you're living a life um, <clears throat> and you're living and you're, you're telling other people, oh, you, you need to be nice to other people. You need to love your neighbor. You need to treat people with empathy. Why? What in your worldview obligates me to act like that if you're an atheist and there is no God? Well, it's your, it's your fellow humans that you should be nice to humanity. Again, why? Why not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? Who cares? Well, ultimately, I came from nothing. I'm going to nothing. Why not just have the best time I possibly can and not worry about what other people think or say or if someone gets hurt? 
okay? So that's how we, we would internally critique. Okay, real, real quick recap. Worldview is a network or a system of our most basic beliefs about reality. And this is wrong. We went through this. Okay, here's what I wanted to show you. Okay, so do you guys ever play golf? Anybody in here ever play golf? No one. All right, great. Oh, Ted, all right, good, thank you. So maybe you're the only one who's going to understand this. All right, so if you ever, if you ever do get, finally get a ball onto the green <laughs> and you're, you're, you're able to make a putt, you usually try to sit behind the ball and, and line it up with, with where you're trying to shoot it in, right, into, into the hole. <clears throat> That's the golfer. Behind him is the caddy. What we want to do basically is get, a, like, sit over God's shoulder and look at all the facts in the world from his vantage point. When you start seeing facts from God's vantage point, now you're gonna your thoughts are going to line up with God's thoughts. God's thoughts are perfect. We want our thoughts to line up with his thoughts. So you want to crouch down, look, look at the world through the lens of Scripture, and see things the way he created them. All right, this slide was supposed to be afterwards, but okay. So questions to ask. Big world, big, big questions to ask the person who is coming against your Christian worldview. What is truth? I did a, a, an interview on, on my channel with some guy. We were going back and forth, back and forth. And I, and I really didn't stick to a presuppositional method until towards the end. Until finally I asked him, we're going back and forth. I said, well, wait a second. What is truth? We're arguing about, you know, this is true, that's true. What is truth? And the guy, he just, he got caught. He's like, and I just let the silence go for about 30 seconds I just waited what is truth he's like reality I said who's he, he just didn't have an answer so he says the same reality as yours I said oh God no 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 <laughs> well then it's not the same reality as mine right what's your standard for truth your standard for truth is not something that you can measure with a scientific experiment it's not something you can see touch way or feel right so it's immaterial what is your starting point? What is ultimate on your worldview? What are you standing on in order to know anything else, in order to see the things around you? How does that ground or provide knowledge? How do you know your starting point is correct? Right? Our starting point is self-attesting. Right? <clears throat> Without the existence of God, you could not know anything for certain. You want to ask them big world, big questions about origin, identity, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where did you come from? How do you know? Evolution. Oh, we got proof for it. Really? You know anybody who's been around a million years to observe it? Isn't that one of the tenets of the scientific method? It needs to be observable? Bah! Is it, doesn't the scientific method say it needs to be repeatable? So it's not observable and it's not repeatable. But you believe it. And it's a fact. It's not faith, right? Sure. Identity. What are you? Are you a person? How do you know? On your worldview, tell me. What's the difference between a bug, a bird, a baby, a bonsai tree, or a boulder? What's the difference on your worldview? We're just all molecules in motion, right? Is there, uh, where are you going? W what is the goal for the world? If, again, if you don't have a box top to shoot for, you can't tell me what I ought to do or ought not to do. There is no ought in a random chance universe. Remember, your starting point affects your worldview. Van Til says this, I propose to argue that unless God is in back of everything, you cannot find meaning in anything. I like that quote. Okay, so now, last week, as God's providence goes, I put up uh, the, the video from last week's lesson. And there's, a, there's an atheist guy who I constantly go back and forth with, and he just... He, he doesn't listen to what I have to say. So he puts this up. He says, who gave birth to Jesus? Who wrote the Bible? Who built the ark? Not God. If people do God's work, then God is useless and not necessary. Funny how people do, do things and claim God told them to do it. It's just as if, as if there wasn't a God. So the week before I had gone, oh gosh, 70, 80 lines with this guy. And I was just like, I'm not doing this. So I said, look, <clears throat> hi, Andrew. I know you lack belief in God and seek 
to comment on my posts which are in favor of the God of the Bible. We need to agree to disagree as it's beginning to look like you're trolling my posts. Like everything I put up, he just keeps going at, right? We've gone round and round numerous times and may never end up agreeing. So why continue making these posts? I don't do that to you and would appreciate if you would respond in kind. Your standard is empathy, right? You want to put yourself in the other person's you know, position and say, oh, okay, you know, they don't want that. Here's his response. Instead of addressing the points I make, you attack me, the messenger. <laughs> he doesn't know what an attack is. <laughs> That's not an attack. All right? So much for the truth will set you free. Now he's quoting the scripture. I didn't even go there with him, right? We both can't be right, so how can you agree to disagree? <laughs> I'm not trolling. I'm educating. Okay. You obviously don't care about what the truth is. You admit you just presupposed truth. We did go round and round. And instead of proving your claims, you attack my worldview, which is irrelevant to your claims. That's not true. You once admitted to me that you do this because it brings comfort to people. And what he's, he's quoting me when I had my debate at Long Island University at Brookville, <clears throat> I said this, and I knew somebody was going to take it out of context. I said, even if, and, I'm, and I said it just like this, even if God didn't exist on your worldview and it comforted somebody, it would be better. I said, I don't believe that God doesn't exist. But on your worldview, it's about comfort. What makes you feel better? So even if God didn't exist and you telling somebody that he did and they found comfort in it, well, that would be beneficial for them. And I said specifically, don't take me out of context. And he has been for the past 10 years. Anyway, um, lots of things can bring comfort, including heroin. But that doesn't make it good. What, are you, what you are doing is holding back science and hindering people from developing skills to deal with reality in favor of a false sense of comfort. You're causing more harm than good, whether you realize it or not. Okay, so here's my response. I'm not going any further with this, and your statement proves your own worldview self-defeating. How can you know I'm causing more harm than good if you don't have an objective standard for good or truth? Okay? He doesn't have a box top. There's no picture of the puzzle that he's trying to create with his worldview. He has no way of knowing if I'm causing harm or good. What standard is he using aside from his own subjective autonomous standard? It's all subjective on your worldview. On your view, there is no way the world should be. Just random chance universe, right? Molecules in motion. Didn't come from anywhere, isn't going anywhere. There's no goal for the world, nor any way to prove objectively except for your subjective feelings and subjective standard, of course. And you exercise your standard of empathy for others, except for my view. Empathy, 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 except for the Christian world, of course. Yeah. You're harming people. I'm educating them. You're harming them. You don't know, you really don't know how much harm you're doing. Okay. Now, I'm, I'll show you his response to this in a minute, but next week, we're going to go through that 70, 80 post thing to show you how the argument plays out. This, just by God's providence, was a quick little example because I knew I wasn't going to be able to fit everything into, into one lesson. So here's his, uh, his response. Seriously? You don't know the difference between harm and good? That's the knockout punch for the Christian worldview. Seriously? You don't know the difference between harm and good? That's the response. Once, you, once I attacked the foundation for his worldview, showing that he has nothing objective to stand on, to prove the standard by which we can understand whether something's harmful or not, and it's subjective inside himself, he can't answer. So now the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. Subjectivity means the standard lies within me. So in other words, I like Rocky Road. You like butter pecan. You like vanilla. Who's right? It's subjective. It depends on the subject. But if, I w if you had a headache and I had a, uh, two bottles, one full of ar aspirin and the other one full of arsenic, right? which would you want? Oh, I prefer arsenic. That's not going to work. 
arsenic's going to kill you, the aspirin's going to help you. It's objective. The standard is outside of yourself, not inside of yourself. So what the atheist does, they go rogue, they go Eve, they go off of God's revelation, and now they say, okay, I'm going to determine what's true based on my, my experience, my experimentation. This is a screwdriver, and you can't prove me wrong. They're not understanding in their metaphysic, their worldview, they have no access to truth or falsity because they don't have an omniscient God revealing it to them. Make sense? Last thing I'm going to leave you with, remember Christopher Hitchens, right? famous atheist, he died of cancer. He used to ask, what's one thing uh, you can say as a Christian that I can't say as, as an atheist? And, you know, none of the apologists that ever answered this, oh, I forgot to, that's, that's his big thing, right? <clears throat> you know, all, none of the apologists really gave him a good answer to this. And I don't know why it stumped so many people, but for me it came simple. Is there an ultimate consequence for evil? What can I say as a Christian that you can't say as an atheist? There is an ultimate consequence for evil. You can't say that. If there's an ultimate consequence for evil, then it matters how we live our lives here and now. If there's no ultimate consequence for evil, who cares how you live? Right? But their lives don't match that. They don't live that way. They, they want to be good people. They just don't understand where the standard of good comes from, and they don't recognize that in their hearts they are evil. They're depraved. They need to be rescued. Right? Okay. So... Any questions with regards to this? Next week, we're gonna, I'm going to break it down to show you a three-step way to um, go at somebody in a competing worldview, and then we're going to go through a, a, lo a much longer conversation between myself, Anthony Esposito, and an atheist. No questions? All right, let's pray.